Welcome to the Masters of Engineering podcast, cool products, the people who develop them and how they do it. I'm your host, John Hirschtick. Today's guest, Daniel Bukuba. He is the co-founder and CTO of Hyphen. They are rethinking how food gets prepared. If you've ever stood in line at Chipotle and watched the person behind the counter prepare your bowl, you're going to be in for a real treat as Daniel talks about how they're automating it with robotics that not only can do it, but do it alongside the human working to prepare food. It's an extremely cool product line. Daniel, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, John, for having me on. Excited well, to be here. You know, I when I um, we're excited to have you because I think the first thing right out of the gates here is that I think everyone on earth everyone who's listening is a potential customer of yours, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Food is ubiquitous and uh, there's nothing more close to what we do every day than, you know, helping work on food. Can you give the audience, tell, tell us, um, tell everyone what it is you're building? Yeah. So at Hyphen, what we're here to do is help kitchens and food service providers become more productive. Uh, you know, one of the personal missions my co-founder Stephen Klein and I had uh, kind of going into this is making machines and tools that help enable the dreams of others and have, having a way to add productivity systems into the kitchen uh, and help out where industries like semiconductor manufacturing or aerospace have created many um, systems and tools to make their operations more effective and new equipment uh, to aid in that and bring that type of technology to restaurants and kitchens that have had a uh, kind of a, a period for over a hundred years where there hasn't been ways to improve work and how, you know, force and displacement of how things are done inside the store. Can you, first of all, tell us your website and also um, can you tell us what we would see if we watched one of your products in action? Yeah, you can find us on use-hyphen.com uh, and you can search hyphen make line on Google and find some videos and some press releases of some of the customers we're working with. Where we start uh, is with a piece of equipment, uh, very similar to what you'd see already in the kitchen. It's called a make table or make line. And mm -hmm. that's where you have pans of food that you hold uh, hot or cold and you put it into the machine or the exact same dimensions of a traditional make line you buy today off the shelf. So it looks like a countertop with food pans on uh, being held on the countertop level. And inside that machine, what we do is we take a stack of bowls, we'll denest them and put them onto a robotic hand that passes them between each of those cabinets. And our machine has dispensers uh, instead of a traditional hotel pan that holds food that will agitate and feed and meter out that product onto the robotic hand that's holding a bowl and uh, place those ingredients onto the bowl by weight and with vision verify what's going on and pass that through until the end where it lifts up on an elevator and then an operator will grab that and put a lid on the bowl and consolidate the order for digital uh, uh, demand at restaurants uh, or um, ordering, let's say, a Chipotle bowl on their app. Uh, it'll go through that system. And then with uh, large food service providers or uh, brands for corporate campuses making hundreds of bowls per day. It looks just like the kind of stainless steel, steel counters you'd see at Chipotle or Sweet Green or something like that, right? It looks the same to the customer anyway, right? Yeah, I find this so fascinating that, you, you know, like, and, and, and the person, while, while your robotic system is making bowls from underneath the ingredient bins, the person can be making bowls at the same time above. Is that right? That's In a traditional right. Way? Yeah, you can have uh, that hybrid operations where for anything that's front of house, uh, food brands and restaurants, they you want to have that personal interaction with someone as you're ordering your meal and they're building it and you're asking for a little bit more chicken or a little bit more guacamole. Yep. So you can still do that on top while the automation happens underneath. And if you have other menu items, let's say like quesadillas or sides that you provide, you can still scoop and portion those above and be more flexible. So our machine really takes care of the portioning and assembly of bowls uh, below. But what you can do with that is also, let's say, take a bowl and put it into a tortilla and wrap a burrito afterwards. Uh, mm. It gives you a lot of flexibility and that consistency 
and quality of portioning. I just think that's like such a genius move to be able to have sort of the, the robot co-working, almost like another person. Like it took me a while to get that. When I looked at your site, by the way, uh, the first time I was like, wait a minute, is this robotic or human? And then, so yeah. the idea, I find this to be really unique. You know, I see a lot of robotic systems and if you just described naively to me, you know, what you were doing, I would have kind of imagined a back room robotic system, mm -hmm. you know, with, with a keep out zone and this robot flying around, putting things in the way a person does or something. But instead you've got this really clever sort of parallel. I just find it really intriguing and might maybe inspirational to some of our, our listeners who design robotics for other things. Do you expect, one of the things I'm dying to ask you is, do you expect most of your customers will use the robotics in simultaneously with the human operators you've described? Or do you think that's a feature that some will use, but others will just go all automation? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And uh, we're, we're seeing the market and uh, we're developing is in two categories. One's with restaurants and food brands, and then the other's with food providers or uh, let's say large organizations like Compass and Aramark who cater to businesses with grab-and-go meals or airports. Uh, so in both cases, there's hybrid operations in the sense that um, at the restaurant, uh, there'll be many other menu items than just bowls. So they can still build those on top. Or if it's a small footprint store, yeah. they can have that front of house make line uh, as well as the uh, bowls being made for digital orders below. Uh, so that hybrid use case is very strong within restaurants. In so that's food. actually... That's not just for show or an occasional thing. That's actually what you expect most customers that will use. All of our restaurant customers are intending for that hybrid use. Uh, and actually another benefit of our system is because we get all this telemetry for the manual building on top. We have uh, lights that guide operators for let's say bin picking and uh, making oh. sure they grab the right ingredient out of the right bin. Uh, and if they need to cool. refill operations, uh, the right alerts around that. Uh, and then in the, um, let's say batch mode, we'll call it, uh, where we make hundreds or thousands of meals a day out of the machine. Uh, it's not as tandem and more of the machine just pumping out a lot of bowls. But the hybrid use case in general, where we think a lot about is the materials we handle are very, uh, they're undeterministic. Uh, they're, they're not like metals and plastics. Yeah. You can analyze the material properties and have a very consistent way of handling them. Uh, there can be prep some days that were done differently than the last. And if there's a jam that's caused by that, you can still assist the machine while still getting the productivity uh, improvements that you want. So we look at the utilization of folks using the machine and if they need to assist to handle a tricky ingredient or let's say things we can't dispense like a very delicate filet of fish or fanned mm. out avocados, uh, you can still have a person add that touch to the bowl and place those ingredients while still netting out the same productivity benefits of if it was uh, fully on. Ah, so I didn't realize that again, watching the videos, um, that so so the the board can light up kind of like I'm seeing in factory cells like um, in my company PTC we have our our um, ThingWorks product line for shop floor I mean for manufacturing floor and it will, it will guide workers and check with AI so you're kind of bringing that to food assembly I didn't realize that so you'll guide the worker to say hey grab this bowl and add avocado you know, you, you mentioned vision which I assume is AI based. Is your AI going to check the work of the human too? Like, will it look at the bowl and say, nice job, Sally. You did a great job prepping. Uh, yeah, no, that's absolutely something that's kind of on our, uh, uh, our plans of today. What we focus on is the machine is so, um, uh, adds so much productivity and capacity to the production of making food. Uh, that is where we start first. And then what's ahead for us is taking that instrumentation, that telemetry, and using it in a way that can guide more of the operators. And uh, with other operations outside of the machine, it's starting to instrument more of the store so that even if you're building a manual bowl off the machine entirely, you can have those same checks that you get in the machine. Uh, so okay. whether it's quality control. Right or throughput and bottlenecks throughout the system. Because I, I think that would be cool if like, you know, 
I, I made it with the person and then the machine said to the person, hey, you put on, you know, banana peppers, not jalapenos, you know, yep. something like that. That would be because those things happen to all of us. I have to ask you, I, I, I had had a college professor in design in college who said to me, whatever we had a saying when I worked in industry, this is what he said to the class. He said, don't take the feeding problem. <laughs> never, <laughs> never sign up for feeding things, you know, bowl feeders, you know, fasteners, yeah. screws. So when yeah. I saw your design, which is all these feeders, right, for like broccoli and radishes yeah, and everything, right. you show, I mean, I thought, did you, did you feel that way when you, when you started building this? Like, did you say you have a lot of experience? Is it true? Like feeding things, it's just really, even feeding the bowls. I'm like, yeah, I forgot about that. You de-stack the bowls. That's gotta yeah. be pretty hard to do. Absolutely. So, so yeah. did you sign up for these impossible problems? Is it still? Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, that is the uh, a very keen observation. And uh, I think the three rule sets that always come top of mind for me is that same thing of material feeding and handling uh, to uh, relying on friction versus positive engagement of a, a part. And then uh, mm -hmm. three, rotary motion over linear motion. So we think about those okay. rules all the time and guiding us. I love hearing that. Those I want to hear those three rules again. So wait, so the three rules are just one. Uh, avoid material handling when you can. Avoid it when you can. Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, two. two rely on positive engagement and not friction okay. and then three rotary motion over linear motion rotary not linear okay those are great rules i'm going to try to remember when i meet some of our i meet many yeah. customers who build automation so is the benefit people get your customers um what what is the top benefit if i went to your customers what do they say this is the best thing yeah about hyphen so there's um, two to, to three different kind of key value propositions, depending on the customer type. Uh, you know, the big one is uh, increased capacity. So we can take what typically on average for all of our customers, uh, operators will build at a rate of 30 to 50 uh, bowls per hour. Uh, in a sustained, non-exhausting rate. Um, and that's with custom bowls and orders coming in through where everyone's unique and, and different. Uh, you can get on the higher end of that band if it's the same bowl getting made in mass. Uh, we can uh, produce uh, between 120 and 180 units per hour with one operator. So you get that capacity increase, which is significant. The other so wait, that's to be clear, That's that sounds like about a 5X? Yeah, it depends on uh, which number of ingredients and how many dispense out of each cabinet yeah. so it's always uh depends on the menu but around up, up to 5x uh, so so one line one line with with one human being and one of your lines can produce as much as this as a similar size line with three four five people working that's right okay so so it wouldn't be that it wouldn't be to replace two lines with one it would be that you'd have less people in the same space. Kind yeah, of. that's right. Okay. Yeah, so you get more capacity and more productivity out of each person that you have mm -hmm. building your food. Uh, mm -hmm. And the other aspect of it, which is also just as strong for some of our customers as productivity, is uh, consistency and quality. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. uh, I think we've all had the DoorDash or Uber Eats order that miss, yep. missing ingredients uh, may have wrong portion sizes than you're yep. used to. So that for a lot of brands is really important so that they have that consistency with their customers. Uh, and then the quality of data coming back. Uh, most, uh, you know, what we're used to in the manufacturing or, or engineering world may be MES systems or uh, work instructions for tracking uh, how a part or an assembly is built. And in the restaurant and food service world, there are tablets and kiosks, which you know folks will bump in order to the next station uh, and kind of reroute it. But things get say, so chaotic. Um, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen too at a fast food restaurant when they have the TVs and they'll just bump through everything at once. <laughs> and the quality of data of what's going on in the store just isn't captured. And we can capture that information, and provide that intelligence back to uh, our customers. And that's going to help them just deliver a better product is there an environmental aspect to what you're doing yeah aspect that we um, also help with is with 
uh, food waste and consistency in the meal. So uh, you you get portioned into the bowl from our machine exactly what you program in. So that controls how you're um, uh, consuming food to fulfill your orders. And then in planning as well, it's very difficult to know in the restaurant or in any food service facility what the actual consumption was in the bowls going out. Typically, you know, restaurants are not weighing the bowls or the portion sizes. Sure. So you get that information to help with your ordering and get more accurate ordering in your supply chain so that you have uh, less spoilage or things expiring on the shelf. It, I, I know that there's actually online on CNBC, there's a story about you, right? Um, being used at Chipotle, right? I saw that, first of all, really cool, fantastic publicity for a startup. I mean, congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. no, it's been yeah. great working with them as a customer and a, and a partner. Yeah, they, uh, uh, Chipotle is a very innovative brand. Uh, and I'd say, you know, from what we've seen across the industry, uh, they are really pushing the boundaries on how they can innovate in food production and uh, providing higher quality meals and more consistency to their customers. That, um, yeah, uh, they invested in us as well as uh, became a customer. And so we're working with them uh, to test out our systems in their pilot kitchens and uh, getting into stores. Is there a Chipotle we can go to and get a hyphen prepared burrito bowl today? So no, right now we're in their test kitchen okay. uh, in their test headquarters. Kitchen. And then okay. next year we're planning to start to grow out into stores. And in your vision, um, if you're as successful as you hope and seem to be heading for, is this something you think would be in every you know, every place like it someday? Or would it just be, hey, only in the high volume locations or those that do a lot of digital orders? Or it would it just be kind of like a standard thing? Yeah, it really depends for, you know, uh, every brand and customer we work with, their store economics and where it makes sense um, to place. But in on Hyphen's side, where we're driving our kind of design of the system to is uh, to be as close to parity of what, uh, size of a traditional make line would be uh, the same mm -hmm. cost, uh, uh, where it will always be more affordable to have our make line than buying a, tr a traditional make line and use that make line for manual builds on top if you need to, uh, or turn on the automation and flip it on when you need to. So we're very sensitive to mm -hmm. kind of every part and cost impact on our bombs that uh, and the way we engineer and design the equipment is very much like a uh, consumer product or automobile more so than, uh, let's say, traditional kitchen equipment where you get a lot of heavy stainless steel with mm. a lot of welding everywhere that adds a lot of cost to those systems. Mm. Um, so we, long-term goals are the co to cost parity where it will just always make sense to buy our make line instead, even if you have not mm. uh, really adopted automation yet. Uh, and yeah, for all of our, our customers uh, across the board, um, if they're going to have to make the table, we'd rather it be ours. You know, you mentioned the benefits of the productivity and the environment. Mm -hmm. Are you actually seeing that where you're getting more hospitality given to the in-person person or more creativity? And, you know, and, and is that really happening or was that just something you speculated on the website? Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, uh, uh, value process, as I was listening to earlier, kind of the, the benefits of what you get with the make line. And then the second, uh, what you do with those, that extra capacity is where you can really lift uh, what you can up provide as a store to your guests. Uh, and I guess we're a good example of that. Um, and the way I think about it too is, uh, in, I'm sure a lot of folks here have read the book, The Goal, uh, which talks about manufacturing and, and supply chains and bottlenecks uh, and a great way to think about lean. Uh, once you provide a lot of extra capacity at fulfillment, which is where most of the bottlenecks are in restaurants, you start to push more uh, uh, bottlenecks up and downstream uh, where you want to make sure guests can get through the line faster so you can start to redeploy that labor towards your line and instead of just waiting for the queue to arrive to the, uh, the make line where someone will build your order you start taking that order throughout the line and greet guests uh, mm -hmm. another case where one of our customers is already um, kind of planning the transition of uh, now that they can have less um, uh, churn of their employees and staff is really hard to 
uh, uh, have folks stay around because it's just really tough jobs um, mm -hmm. to increase the pay of the staff that they'll have so that they can retain them for longer uh, and then put those folks more front of house rather than back of house. Uh, so what mm -hmm. we're really excited about yeah, is when enabling this extra capacity and productivity in the kitchen, you can spend less time doing the, the grunt work of um, portioning out and fulfilling digital orders that can get uh, rush periods and redeploy that labor elsewhere to improve the customer experience. In a lot of cases too, it's really, the restaurant industry and business is a tough business. Um, it's hard to hire folks to uh, fill positions that are open and it ends up putting a lot of stress on the folks who are there running the shift uh, and working that shift. So it'll make quality of life better uh, and more humanizing for folks you know, operating in this really difficult to hire for environment and restaurants. Uh, and in cases where restaurants want to redirect those um, savings towards improving the, the guest experience and front of house interactions uh, or to improve retention, which is also a pretty significant cost in the industry. Yep. It, uh, it is around 150% uh, 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 churn in the industry per year. So it's, it helps with that cost to keep things more stable for the teams that do work the shifts. That's great. What inspired you to name the company Hyphen? Where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. We wanted something that would be you know, really memorable, but also to, you know, we see the evolution of kitchen technologies and food service technologies to be similar to manufacturing in that uh, we, let's say, a thing I think about a lot is manual mills to CNC mills. We're going through that transition right now with our make line. And we want to be the connector of uh, kind of innovation to the kitchen industry. So we thought hyphen would be a great way to name our company of uh, hyphens connect words together. And we want to connect uh, the restaurant and food service industry to innovation and the future. Very, uh, very cool. I could not have guessed that. I saw a video online, great video, um, uh, how Hyphen uses Formlabs 3D mm -hmm. printing, like so many mm -hmm. um, uh, designers and engineers use. I mean, I see the Formlabs printers everywhere, great mm -hmm. product line. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us, so you're a Formlabs 3D printing user extensively, right? Yeah. Tell us how you use 3D printing. And do you do it, do you do anything unique with it that you think our audience could learn from? Yeah, and it, yeah, absolutely. And it kind of goes back to the material handling challenge we were talking about earlier. So mm -hmm. you know, across our machine, we use 3D printing just like any hardware company and startup would to, you know, rapid mid parts for concept testing, fixtures, uh, in kind of bridge production. But also um, uh, the most challenging problem we have, uh, besides making the machine so compact and to fit all this automation controls into, is the dispensing of each ingredient and unique type of ingredient. Because we can't analyze uh, predictably all of the changing material property conditions of every unique type of food, and we have you know, over 500 that we've tested throughout our feeding systems and dispensers. Um, you know, we've attempted to, with uh, install machines and 3D scanners and some ANSYS simulation tools, simulate how food will jam, bridge, or get damaged through our feeders. And the time it takes to set up that simulation uh, can be far longer than us 3D printing a dispenser with new feeding elements and experimentally testing and driving towards a more optimal design and creating models around the experimental tests. So what we've uh, kind of steered towards in our R&D is to uh, go through and do a lot of rapid DOE cycles uh, with 3D printers and set up experiments. And when we're going through these, these uh, in our product development life cycle of 3D printing or just new dispenser or adding new dispensers our, our improving dispensers will have every one of our nine form labs printers running nonstop uh, and end up looking at the cost of us getting to a certain milestone and deadline of uh, resolving a new design and weigh the cost of sending it out to get more capacity, even though we have nine, we'll overrun that for a short period of time. Nine. You but, said you have nine form labs printers. And can I ask again if it's confidential and say, but how many um, design engineers, you know, roughly users, how many? Users yeah. of 3D printing. We have about a dozen users. So uh, you have almost a printer per person 
Cool. And that will uh, extend our capacity. Because if you think about like setting up a design of experiment, you'll yeah. want to look throughout your control factors and the ranges and how many midpoints you want within your model of uh, uh, yeah. testing that you may need to make a few to run your experiment at at the same time. So that allows us to get that flexibility of tossing a lot of parts to get feedback in this very difficult to analyze problem of material. I, I love it. I love this, this whole discussion of design of experiments because sometimes people are saying to me, well, you know, like the old thinking is, well, we'll use 3D printing to make a, you know, a looks, you know, a appearance prototype or a quick functional, but you're really using it essentially as you're outpacing digital analysis with, in simulation with physical mm -hmm. because you're able to. Um, uh, great, great story. Love it. Um, can't resist asking you. I know you know about how your your CAD and PDM tools. I know you're an on shape customer, and yeah. you know, I, you know I, I'm an <laughs> on shape guy here. Um, and by the way, Formlabs is also an on shape customer. But can you tell us, you know, how how where does a CAD and PDM come into that, if if any way, in your design of experiments in this fast kind of agile prototyping you're doing? Oh, yeah, that's such a great question because yeah, as um, you know, a 15 year SolidWorks user myself before we switched over to Onshape uh, about two, three years ago, uh, what you would typically do in let's say a traditional CAD system is have all these experiments as you know a save as copy file with a different file name. Uh -huh. and you're you know uh -huh. spending so much time and you got a CAD admin who's uh, it can keep things organized in PDM. You can kind of set up some more tracking around the versions and all the changes you're going through. But because we have you know many different unique control factors and how we need to adjust our designs uh, for every individual dispenser, and we have 500 different ingredients and each. Uh, there's over a dozen different dispensers we have. Uh, the permutations of those experiments start to branch off where in Onshape we can literally create branches and then use those to reconcile and tag to an experiment and quickly iterate or toss it onto another engineer. It's very collaborative with our teams where it's not, uh, you know, one person owns a dispenser, but a lot of other folks will bring in their ideas and have a, a cool concept for something they want to try to help a problem with a particular ingredient and can jump into that model, mm -hmm. uh, create a new branch and kind of have their sandbox to work with. So it increases that frequency of iteration and collaboration that traditionally, you know, it's very sluggish or there's a lot of friction to get through. In a, uh, well, yeah, uh, of course, I love hearing this, but I am a, a, a co-founder and longtime CEO of SolidWorks where I spent 18 years and I'm a co-founder and was was a uh, CEO and general manager of Onshape, general manager of the Onshape business at PTC. Now I'm chief evangelist. But so anyway, having kind of been one of the founder leaders of both products, I totally agree with you. In fact, this was the very vision we had was, in fact, as you talk about the branches, branching in, in mechanical design, one of the things I hear a lot about, I've written some about, is agile process like we mm -hmm. see in software with sprints and scrums and branching and merging. Coming to hardware, do you think that that's appropriate to talk about agile process in hardware? Do you think, no, 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 I wouldn't say that. No, I, I mean, I have, uh, you know, prior to Hyphen, I was um, I'm a, a, a system integrator building custom machine tools for factories. And we'd worked a lot with... Uh, whether it's uh, Intel or applied materials or um, uh, a government contractor, as well as a lot of startups. But, um, you know, we're, we're typically in mechanical engineering, very kind of fixed on a, a very rigid process to ensure consistency, predictability, uh, quality in the design life cycle. And as a startup, what we want to encourage is to take risks and to be very rapid in those iterations and to not have as a uh, high of a friction system in PLM, uh, not just the tools we use, but in how we manage it internally to allow for a lot of frequent change and a lot of, uh, we want to be able to introduce hardware. Uh, you know, we believe that you can be just as fast as software in hardware uh, you just need to tack on the lead time of manufacturing the physical part uh, mm -hmm. at the end of it. And we'd rather be, you know, systems engineering, and there's a lot of dependencies throughout everything from firmware and software and your hardware uh, and your electrical systems most of the time. So you 
I want to make the individual nodes within the systems engineering and uh, teams working together to be as rapid as possible because in the end, the dependencies of the system, even from software and hardware can, you know, software can be just as long as hardware in certain cases mm -hmm. and uh, on the electrical considerations as well. So uh, yeah, we see when you're, the hardware teams are working on their own, you know, uh, if they have a new design for a dispenser, uh, they'll design that change in one day, print it overnight, and start testing it the next day. And the more shots on goal we have and the tighter we make that feedback loop, it compounds for us. And that's how we can be so fast. And, um, and the, the machine you'll see out in the field, uh, out with Chipotle, uh, is press and uh, kind of uh, the videos of it running. That version of the machine was developed within about uh, seven months uh, from the ground up, our Gen 2 system. So uh, we can't hit that pace unless we think hardware is just as fast as software. And it's just the time it takes to print or get a part from a, a, a supplier we have for rapid turn parts to do the last part of testing physically. Uh, the design. Seven months? Yeah. Wow. Is there anywhere other than Chipotle where we could, is there anywhere I can buy any kind of food made with your uh, some, uh Right now we can't talk about our customer uh, okay. pipeline uh, and we have some stadiums, we have some business parks uh, and some restaurants that will be serving to the. Uh, I, I can't the wait. Uh, I can't wait. You said 500 ingredients. Can I just ask you again, if it's not confidential? Yeah. Which is the hardest, you know, the nightmare ingredient and which is like the layup, the fastball down the middle that you wish we all ordered? Yeah. What, what are the extremes here in ingredient? The land? things that keep us up at night are uh, yeah. avocados, like sliced avocado, okay. avocado. Uh, blaze of fish uh, and long and stringy pastas or noodles. Uh, those ah. are, let's say, things that right now we can't uh, dispense uh, and the ones okay. that challenging that we can dispense are things like, let's say, um, shredded meats or uh, anything where there are uh, uh, food particles can kind of interleave and tangle together, or if it's very sticky, those types of foods uh, are difficult to, what uh, we call material handling, deagglomerate or declump uh, while de not changing yeah. the ingredient and being able to present it well and have those the with metering so that we can get to the portion size that we need. I see. So you have to declump and not damage it. Mm -hmm. And then what's an easy one? What's an ingredient you want us all order? Yeah, the easy ones day in and day out are things like rice, uh, beans, or okay. chopped vegetables. Uh, so yeah. when you look at a lot of food automation out there, um, things that are very granular that don't stick together, uh, those are okay. typically the first thing get automated in food. Right, rice, beans. Are you going to be bringing hyphen to other countries? Mm -hmm. Is this going to work in in Europe, in Asia? Is that yeah, we've had a lot of folks uh, reach out to us with either large portfolios of restaurants or smaller chains or new startups in uh, Europe and in Asia. Uh, and uh, we definitely want to get there. Right now, we see you know as startups are going to be very laser focused, and um, uh, mm -hmm. we're focusing on the North American market right now. Uh, and primarily domestically. Uh, so as we start to grow, we'll continue to open up into new markets. I just want to really thank you, uh, Daniel. And uh, so again, for everyone out there listening or watching, um, I want to say our guest today has been Daniel Kukuba, who is the CTO and founder at Hyphen. And it's been fascinating talking with you, not only about what you're doing you know, overtly, but all the thought that went into it and some really um, innovative things. And, you know, you, you, you know, my professor said, don't take the feeding problem. And you took the feeding problem 500 times over. I'm just so impressed with that. Um, I want to thank our listeners for joining us. Um, Daniel, for the, those, of our, those of our listeners who want to learn more or reach out and contact you, how can they learn more? How can they contact you? Yeah, you can find our website at use-hyphen.com. And uh, for anyone who want to reach out to me, you can email me at daniel at use-hyphen.com. And thanks for being such a great guest. If, if you want to hear more episodes, tune in to Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and on YouTube with the video, leave us reviews. You can follow me on Twitter at jhirschick, J-H-I-R-S-C-H. 
T-I-C-K. And Dana, once again, thanks so much. We're all going to be so excited the day we get our, our bowl at Chipotle or elsewhere and know that it was you and Hyphen that did it. Um, thanks, thanks so much for taking the time to be here. Oh, thank you, John, as well. And uh, I think as I told you before we got started, I considered SolidWorks as my video game in high school. So uh, it's great to be on here with you and we're excited to yeah, have uh, our machines out in the world. Well, thanks so much. Uh, that's it for today. See you all next time on Masters of Engineering.